Welcome to the True Face Podcast, where we have conversations about what we can learn from what's going on in our lives. My name is Robbie Angle, and I'll be your guide as we learn how to increase trust and experience grace. Most of us get stuck in our relationships with God and others, and we end up wondering, is this really all there is to it? True Face equips you to experience deeper relationships with God and others, equipping a growing group of men and women with a toolbox of teaching and experiences to help you become more fully known, fully loved, and fully alive. And on this episode, I'm super honored and blessed to have a newer friend of mine, uh, Michael Cusick. Michael is a licensed professional counselor, spiritual director, speaker. He authored a book that had a big impact on me before we ever met called Surfing for God. The subtitle is Three Easy Steps to Stop Masturbating. Um, No, it's not. It is Discovering the Divine Desire Beneath Sexual Struggle. And Michael experienced uh, the restoring touch of God in a deeply broken life and marriage. And, and, and he might share some of that story today, but his passion is to connect life's broken realities with the reality of the gospel. He leads a ministry called Restoring the Soul um, and equips Christian organizations around the world. Um, he was professor, adjunct professor at Dem- Denver Seminary, full-time at Colorado Christian. He's got a bunch of accreditations and educational stuff, and he is married to Julianne in Littleton, Colorado. And Michael, I want to start. What did I miss anything in that? Welcome to True Face Podcast, man. This is overdue. It's so good to be here, and um, I know it's going to be a good conversation based on the fic- fictional subtitle of the book. And I can't wait for that person that hits the fifteen second forward, and they get to the part where it says three steps to stop masturbating. That's going to be really great. And I'm sure that your listeners will just grow exponentially as a result of that. (laughs) So Michael, uh, I could have introduced you as a sex expert. Is that appropriate? Uh, In the last 10 years since I I, I wrote the book, I've done a lot of teaching and work in that area. And at the seminary level, I taught a class called Human Sexuality. Uh, But I, I, I prefer to think of myself as as a student of the soul uh, and sexuality is a, a deep part of our soul and so uh, I guess when you say expert in sexuality I go oh shucks that's such a such an infinite mystery that it's hard to master that I uh, you know as you're, you're such a phenomenal counselor and as a as a friend, you're like a doctor, you know, like we all have a friend that's a doctor or an attorney and we have breakfast or lunch and we're like, oh, by the way, can you look at this? You know, like <laughs> that thing. Um, I'm going to fight that temptation because I've already done that to you as a friend. I remember w- we were having breakfast and I, I unabashedly hijacked it and said, hey, can I get a free hour of counseling? And it was actually God used that in a cool way to implant some truths in my life. So I'm not going to spend the next 30 minutes talking about Emily and I's sex life, even though that'd probably be really good for ratings and sharing and all that. But uh, not not good for your marriage. If no, if not, <laughs> she she would not. It, I mean, it might be good for my marriage in some ways, but not in regards to. No, it would be terrible. She would kill me, um, and that would prevent anything else from happening. So the. Uh, there's two things I need to confess as a friend. Let's start as friends and then we'll get into the podcast. Um, I, I haven't shared these two things, but they're just two things that uh, I, I struggle with that you trigger in me. You ready? Okay. Yeah. The first one is every time I listen to your podcast, Restoring the Soul podcast plug, it's awesome. Uh, a lot of them you have that, hey, we're hiring license psychotherapist and there's something in me I, i'm i'm working on contentment and presence and i feel like god's called me here for a long time to true face but i still carry my lpc even though i haven't practiced in forever and right. there's not many things that tempt me and that tempts me every time i hear it i'm like god should i should i like go sit at the feet and learn from michael and and get into like therapy and intensives again anyway so i struggle with it every time i'm like what is that i i'm triggered by that the second thing is uh you every time we meet and and when i hear you teach i feel like you understand you at least articulate the true face teachings and principles better than i do uh which stokes insecurity in me as the new guy taking over from john bill and bruce 
living into articulating, understanding the depths of truths of grace applied in our lives. And you, I learn from you in these truths. And so it's that tension of, of joy to stay to the feet and learn from you and also annoyance that you know it so much better than I. But anyways, <laughs> I need to share this. Well, thank you for sharing both of those. Let me respond to the first. I know you didn't necessarily ask for a response, but I think the the, the only reason maybe why I, I might know some things better than you, and certainly you know things better than me, is I've lived longer. And I think one of the criteria for understanding the gospel is A, uh, years. That That's why we're called to mature, which requires time and development. And so the older we get, the more we can have an understanding of the infinite mystery of God and grace. But the other side of that coin, B, would be that uh, life has beat the hell out of me and I have failed profoundly, you know, which is part, part of my story. And I've been given the gift of brokenness and mm. uh, I haven't always seen that as a gift. And days like today where I got up and I was just moving slow and excited about this podcast, but kind of feeling some of the seasonal affective stuff of winter. And I was like, I just want to go back to bed. Um, and I've got a funky neurological system. I've lived with bipolar type two disorder since the late nineties. And, uh, the brokenness is an invitation to know the good news that I'm deeply loved. Even when I don't feel that, uh, that I'm deeply loved on my worst day as well as my best day. And the reason why I think you feel that I resonate with the message that Bruce and Bill and John began to articulate several decades ago is one, I've, I've known those guys both from a distance and been able to spend time with each of them. Um, but True Face does as good a job as any organization on the planet in articulating the good news of who God is. And sometimes I hesitate to say the good news of the gospel because that word has been hijacked by a lot of preachers, organizations, and authors that like to define the gospel as a set of propositions or as dogma that we then split hairs over versus the gospel is a declaration from the mountaintops and from the, 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 the curbs and gutters of the inner city of who God is. The gospel is just, God is way better than you think he is. And so that's, that's what I've lived in. That's what I've sought. That's what I've hoped to understand. That's what I hope to have a better understanding of before I die. And I just think True Face does that in a way that's not only profound, but it's so practical. And you guys bring that to people in a way that is subversive and you know you guys aren't a big sexy ministry and I hope you never become that uh, because you have as a leader Robbie have the capacity to do that but the beauty is that it's just organic and it just sprouts up everywhere and it becomes very relational as opposed to programmatic so and and regarding you you know feeling uh like you want to be part of what we're doing in Colorado I think that's God's will and that you should quit your job that you should move living in Atlanta and come to Colorado and join our team. We're looking for people just like you. We cannot staff enough counselors. This started with me doing intensive counseling with leaders uh, 22 years ago, and we now have six full-time counselors and an additional staff of five, and we'd like to hire four more counselors in the next 24 months uh, to really be able to meet the needs of, of pastors and missionaries and parachurch leaders and, and people that are influencers for the kingdom of all kinds. So please, please, please join us. I, uh, if you're listening to this, I, uh, maybe that's for you because these intensives, as a counselor doing traditional outpatient therapy, uh, we would look for the opportunity to just do an intensive, not an hour a week, but like go in deep and process some stuff. And I've got friends, uh, who have done the intensives, uh, with restoring the soul and, it's been transformational. So one of these days I'm coming uh, and, and letting you take me through the ringer. If, put me down for 2026 whenever your next opening is. But uh, I'm coming, man. So th there's all kinds of stuff I want to talk to you about. And I want to um, jump into a couple. But I mean, we could go anywhere from accountability, which is often an interesting thing, which 
you gave words about in Surfing for God to your story and your journey, because what you said of the brokenness being an invitation, I'm like, oh man, tease that out, that learning. Or, um, I mean, we could go all kinds of places. Is there anything on partic- in particular on your heart, um, the process of where you're at and what's going on in your head or your heart? Yeah, and hopefully we can we can weave this thought all throughout everything you just said. And I'm happy to go anywhere you want. And I, I'll come back on your program anytime because it's great to look at you on the screen. And we always have good conversations. Um, I, I'm writing a book with InterVarsity Press. Uh, and this is the first time I've talked about publicly that I'm with InterVarsity. But uh, we came to an agreement uh, contractually in early December. And um, my hope is to be done with the book May 1st. But it's called Love Has You, or at least that's the working title. Love Has You, Imagining Faith That Restores the Soul and Repairs the World. And uh, when I wrote Surfing for God, it came out in June of 2012. And, you know, when you write a book, you, you send copies out to friends and people who you admire and maybe haven't met and influencers. And I sent a copy to Richard Rohr, Father Richard Rohr, the Franciscan in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And... I've been a fan of his for a long time, and uh, I grew up Catholic and spent a lot of time in a Catholic monastery where his spirituality influenced them. And he was kind enough to write me back. And I've since learned, when I finally got a chance to meet Richard a couple years ago, that he receives three to five books every day that people send him that they've written, like from all over the world. And says, I just, I just want you to know that you've influenced me, and so, and he writes a thank you note back to every person, wow. and I, I was just blown away by that. And here's the point of the story: is at the little, kind of, closing of the letter, he wrote instead of sincerely yours or you know bless you in Christ, he wrote love has you, comma, Richard. Mm. And as soon as I read that, I felt this kind of wave go through my body and this was in 2012 and I was still going through a lot of healing from trauma and I was really uncertain about the impact that the book would make and was it wise to put that much of my story out there and love has you and I've I've meditated on that and pondered that and have studied that in the scriptures and I've taught on that and that really is the theme of my life. That's the proclamation of the gospel. And if somebody says, what's the gospel? I would say the gospel is that love, with a capital L, has you. And that love has a face and a name. And his face looks like Jesus, and his name is Jesus. And he is the visible image of the invisible God that this world, in all of its brokenness and pain, brings upon us that raises this question, well, how can I trust God, you know, if he lets blank or with all the suffering in the world? And the answer in Jesus is that uh, that he's good, that he chose humiliation, that he chose to experience everything that we have experienced in terms of suffering and pain, and, and, and that today he bears our wounds and that we are hidden within his wounds. And so this is the big idea that I've been writing and thinking about. And then I like to pair that as a psychotherapist with the idea of what does that mean on a human level? Mm. And for people that are wrestling with that question that you stated at the beginning of the, the, the program today, that's part of the True Face mission statement, you know, if you're somebody who has said, is this all there is? and you're searching for more, you know, and I know, because we sit with people and we've had to wrestle with this ourselves, that you can't get to the more, when you ask the question, is this all there is? No, there's more, with just cognitive truth, propositional truth, with intellectual. You have to experience that. And to the degree that we've experienced that on the human level, we'll be able to experience it on the spiritual level. And it's very rare for someone to experience a kind of, intimate care from God if they don't have that experience in their background. And in fact, people like Kurt Thompson have written as physicians with the neuroscience of this, that we literally don't possess the neural networks in our brain to experience Mm. soothing, Mm. to experience on a felt level that sense of being known. You know, another part of your mission statement is to grow in your capacity to be known by God. 
And so um, four S's that I regularly talk about that will be prominent in the book Love Has You are there's these four S's. And this is not original with me. This is teaching from uh, Dr. Dan Siegel, the, the kind of inventor, if you will, of interpersonal neurobiology. And he said that there's four S's that every human being needs from infancy onward. We now use the phrase that these are these are needs from womb to tomb. So no matter how old we are, and it's to be seen, to be soothed, to have a sense of safety that's physical and emotional safety, and those lead to a sense of security, deep security. And that if we didn't get those, as many listeners will say, well, shucks, I guess I'm, I'm out of luck, you know, because I, I missed those or I missed one of those in a certain area, that we can actually, in human relationships, as we make ourselves vulnerable, as we allow ourselves to be known, we can re-experience being seen and being soothed and being safe in a community of people, whether that's one-on-one -on -one with a friend who's discipling you, mentoring you, psychotherapist, priest, pastor. And to the degree that you experience those, it will allow you to feel secure. And I think the ultimate statement of security is love has me. It is well with my soul. Quote Julian of Norwich, all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. I know that in my head. I can preach that, but I don't feel that in my body as often as I want to, where I've got this experiential felt sense of God is with me, God is for me, uh, and that that I am okay regardless of what's happening. Well, you're speaking to something we long for, that 18-inch that journey from our head to our heart. And a lot of us listening know tons about this scriptures of Love, God is love, Jesus is the face and the representation of of love. What's been your process like personally for you? Like how, how has that progressed from knowledge to experiential? And you alluded to the practice of that interpersonally in, in affecting the the up, you know, the, the whole dynamics of up and in, out, interconnectedness of practicing and experiencing love. What's been the differentiator for you in this moving from your head as a heady guy into your experience, which I know you experience with him? Uh, I think there's so many different directions I could go with that. And, you know, you, this would be a fun thing to do. And I always say this with people I love to have conversations with. Let's do a year-long podcast. And, like, if I won the Powerball, all I would do is get together with different friends and do a year-long podcast where we just have 52 conversations about a topic. Yeah. But, of course, yeah. that would lead to, to 52 more podcast topics. Yeah. I, I, I think the first thing is truth. And people might be surprised but I, what I mean by this because you've already made the distinction between information truth, like read my Bible. We all know John 8.31, the truth will set you free, right? And what is truth? And if you ask most Christians, they'll be like, well, truth is the Bible. Um, Jesus said he's the way, the truth, and the life, and his word is truth. And, and that is absolutely right. And we can all quote scriptures where the Bible says that. But there's another truth, and that's my truth and your truth. And my truth is I woke up this morning, and I wanted to go back to bed and pull the covers over my head. Of course, irrespective of the time, time with you, and after this, I'll... I don't think I'll want to go back and uh, pull the covers over my head. And my point there, parenthetically, would be because of relationship and connection. And as mm -hmm. soon as I saw you on the screen, and as soon as we started talking, I connected with my heart. And so my truth of I woke up and it's kind of a gray back-to-bed day, and then the truth of, wow, I get to look Robbie in the eye, and we get to connect about things that deeply matter to me. There's mm -hmm. something that starts to happen in my nervous system. There's endorphins and all kinds of things are, and, and I feel, I, I'm now like, oh, that was two hours ago, and I forgot about waking up on the wrong side of the bed. So in Surfing for God, I quote Dr. Eki Kakuli, who is a physician in Kenya, and she was the discipler of, of one of my friends, and my friend told me this years ago, and I've never forgotten it. Dr. Kakuli said that Jesus only meets us in our realities, not our illusions. And so the starting point for this movement from the head to the heart is my reality, my truth, 
my life, my story. And for the first 10 to 14 years of my Christian life, I had two stories. There was my inner story that was impacted by abuse and trauma and addiction and shame and all these lies that I believed. And then there was this outer story that I was pretty good at projecting, but the two of those never actually connected. And this leads to my passion for our ministry, which is what I call the gap or the delta. And in science, a delta is you know the, the Greek symbol that looks like a triangle, and it's the distance between where you are and what you want to measure. Like, here's what we have to do to get on the moon, here's all these precise factors we need to calculate, and here's where we are, and the delta is that gap. So many people, especially people that are drawn to restoring the soul and true faith, in that sense of isn't there more, they're experiencing this gap, this delta. But the beautiful thing is there's another kind of delta, and that's the delta of a river. And the delta of a river is where these two different substances of brackish, muddy water in a river that's fresh water, and then salt water, when the river runs into the sea, they mix together. And there's this blending and this integration of two different realities. And that's the delta that we actually are hungry and thirsty for. As you talked about, there's a longing for that, to be whole, to be one, to have these disparate parts of who we are brought together. But we can't do that until we are brutally honest relationally in community with others about the reality of either just the salt water or the muddy fresh water and how that's keeping us from the wholeness and the integration that we want. And so for my life, the truth telling has been largely involuntary. Where 1994, as you know, and I write about in the book, uh, I came home from work one day, married three years in ministry. I got caught in a lie, my whole double life began to spill out. It was the worst day of my life, the best day of my life, where my sexual addiction, my alcoholism, that all got exposed. And by God's grace, Julianne and I are together and ministering out of that wound. Um, so truth, the truth of our story, the truth of the disconnect. I, I think the second thing is to, I want to say to be still, but for so many people, what that means is I need to sit in my room and not move or go to a monastery and have a retreat. And it can include that but what I mean by being still, because we all know Psalm 4610, be still, know that I'm God, is to cease striving. Mm. And again, so much of your message with True Face is about not striving. Mm. Dallas Willard said to me in a conversation where I have an interview with him on our podcast, he said, most Christians are stuck between ceaseless striving or their brokenness. Then he paused in his classic way and he said, is there another way? Is there another way to live other than those two realities? And he described the delta. You're either ceaselessly striving, trying to be okay, trying to make your life work to somehow access the promises of God and the freedom and the joy. Or it's like, oh, I'm screwed and my life is just this way and I'm always going to be addicted to porn or I'm always going to struggle with anger or uh, fill in the blank. And there is another way, you know, and that's, that's why you and I do get out of bed in the morning, is to bring that other way to people. So for me, the idea of being still and ceasing striving is to place myself positionally and with a posture in the loving gaze of God. And I think it's wonderful that people who have spiritual disciplines will sit and be with the written word of God but if people come to me and they say, you know, I, I just have a real hard time connecting with God or things feel really dry, um, I'll, I'll often talk about, well, what level of awareness do you have about what's happening inside of you? Not just your feelings, but your body, your sensations, and somatically. And I'll, I'll pause because it looks like you want to answer another question, but I'll say this. Many, many years ago, I read a book that, that you'll know by Brother Lawrence that's collected work in letters from Brother Lawrence in the 15th century. He worked in a, a, a monastery, but he was a dishwasher. He wasn't one of the theologically trained monks. And as he was washing dishes, he said that he had a deeper prayer life and felt closer to God washing dishes than when he was in the monastery chanting the Psalms seven times a day with the monks. And the monks started to come to him 
and say, tell us how you have this prayer life and this experience of God. And that became the, the, the classic book, Practicing the Presence of God. So I, I went to a conference. I heard about that book, and I was like, I'm going to read Practicing the Presence of God. I'm going to master being present to God and, like, always attending to him. And every thought I'm going to make around him. And I failed miserably, and I still fail miserably at this. And what I've come to conclude, Robbie, is that I can't practice the presence of God much less be present to anyone at a deep level if I can't be present to myself. Hmm. To be aware of, as a young man and as a young Christian, and even now, many times when I'm with people, I have a compulsive, nervous energy in me, and you know this about me, to crack jokes, to do things that are funny so that you laugh, and then that gives me a dopamine rush inside of myself, so I feel less nervous and less anxious with you, because even though I am very extroverted, I get really interpersonally nervous and anxious with people. And so I have to practice the presence of Michael and be aware of that as I'm with others. So, so often what my faith practice looks like is sitting down and taking some deep breaths. And sometimes I read my Bible and sometimes I don't. And I go, okay, Father, okay, Jesus, okay, Holy Spirit, here I am love on me and mm. and that's kind of all I do and I struggled with that for a while to the point where I said I think I'm losing my faith because like I don't want to do anything else and I can't do anything else and nothing else makes sense and God basically said to me well what would be so bad about you losing your faith and it was like a chuckle that he was mm. doing with me like a like a father to a son like do you think that your faith is actually dependent on you do you think that you're the one that has initiated and sustains this relationship? Don't you see that I'm here with my arm around you? And you can close your eyes and go to sleep, or you can walk away, and my arm is still around you, and I'm not going anywhere. And there's just such a freedom in that. And um, I seek that kind of freedom, and yet I struggle with, I need to be doing more. I need to be doing more. And when I come to accept the fact that I don't need to be doing more, I actually want to do more. It's like the faucet opens up within me to pursue God, to dig deeper into his word. But then if I start to think like, yeah, this is impressive to God, <laughs> and, and, and this is what I need to be doing, it's almost like God sprinkles fairy dust on me and goes, I'm going to make Michael feel like he's in a desert or disillusioned about faith so that he can come to see again. This is just not about his initiation or his performance or anything like that all right i uh have a lot of questions and i, I want to practice though something different um I, a mentor of mine said after you read a chapter of scripture you know or a section of scripture pause and just ask the question god what do you have for me in this as part of a rhythm and so i'll pause and let you, as we just heard a lot of truths that resonated in different ways with us, to let you, to honor you listening wherever you are, to just say, Father, what do you have for me in that? What resonated with me that you want me to hear? So a question I have for you to follow up that, thanks y'all for doing that with me. Uh, Michael, there's a tension that you articulated that we're designed to grow through the context of community. We can't, that our formation, our growth will be in the context of practice with each other um, in, in how we're designed with like uh, the neurobiology and all that stuff. But then there's that element of the brother Lawrence intimacy of the the, the up and the in, you know, and, and I, I, it's the chicken egg thing, which I know is in a fair equation because it's all interconnected, but tease out for us how the connection to God with your presence of understanding who you are and security and soundness of that. Uh, obviously, I can see how that would lead towards others, um, to loving others differently in the soundness of who you are rooted in who he says you are and your experience with him first of love, easier to love others. But tell me how the power of that community has been a catalyst for your experience of more deep awareness of who you are and your soundness and your vertical relationship with God. 
Well, earlier in the podcast, you started by saying you had a confession, and it was twofold. So I'll, I'll reciprocate with a confession because that's the best thing to do, and maybe that's the answer to your question. Um, here's my confession. I suck at community. And, and let me apologize for people that are offended by that word. I just don't know any other word. If I said, I'm not very good at community, or I really need more community, I, I don't think that would connotate what I am aware of in my life right now. You and I are professional Christians. We are professional relators. We make a living by, if you will, having close, meaningful relationships with people, pastorally, discipleship-wise, mentoring, psychotherapy. And as a psychotherapist, Dan Elder once said that therapy is the most intimate of relationships in the least personal of contexts. So there's this sense where I'm immersed all day, every day, in relationships. And so first of all, I have to tell myself the truth, back to taking my own medicine, that sometimes I don't want community. I'm exhausted from relationships. We have a neurodiverse family filled with autism and other kind of developmental issues uh, with one of our kids. And life can be exhausting. And at this stage of my life, not unlike when I was a young parent uh, 20-some years ago, sometimes I just want to go home and be in my little man cave in my basement and do guitar scales for an hour, not even for the purpose of getting better at the guitar, but just as a way of kind of self-soothing. Mm. Secondly, because of this professional world that I live in, my two closest friends live in different parts of the country, one in Nashville, one in New York City. And that happens to be kind of cool because I get to go there more often than, than um, I would otherwise. But I don't get to sit down with them face to face the way that I want to. I don't get to have enough breakfast the way I want to. So we have to have regular times that we connect. And I have to be very, very, very intentional to open up my life. One of them, because I'm a, for those of your listeners that are familiar with the Enneagram, I'm an Enneagram 2, a helper, a giver. One of them, I, I'll call up from time to time and I'll just go, hey, how you doing? I was thinking of you. Uh, are you okay? And he'll immediately know that I'm calling to ask how he's doing so that I'll feel better about myself and feel connected. And suddenly I'm needed and I'm indispensable and I'm helpful as opposed to, hey, I called you. I, I kind of don't care how you're doing, but I woke up today and I want to go back to bed and I'm lonely and I'm struggling with overeating. And so will you just ask me questions? Will you just listen? Will you just speak into my life? Will you just be my friend? And he's called me on that so many times that now we just laugh. And I have to kind of call and say, and I've literally done this, I need a friend. Mm. Oh, okay. And, and then it goes from, a, you know, talking about football or whatever. We don't actually do that because neither one of us know anything about football. Um, and I, I just, I'm not naturally good at it. Now, if you met me, you would say Cusick is relational, he's extroverted, he's funny, he can be the life of the party, but that doesn't mean that I'm good at relationship and connecting one-on-one -on -one or even in a small group. And I think that we need to learn the difference. Hmm. So I would say in response to your question, community is absolutely essential. I would go so far as to say we cannot grow mature, develop, become who we were meant to be outside of relationship. In the same way that an infant cannot grow outside of the loving arms and gaze and um, biological food nurturing and nourishing of a parent in the same way. That's why Jesus ended all of his teaching on the last night of his life by saying, here's, here's my final message. You ready? Three pages of paper. Get ready to take notes. And he basically used one word, abide, remain, stay right here. Hmm. Shh, I've got you. Just let me hold you. And the vine and the branch was the image that he gave us. 
And he basically said, okay, here it is. If you want to fulfill the Great Commission, if you want to know me intimately, if you want to be one like the Father and the Spirit and I, just be the branch and be attached to me, the vine. I've got you. And that's a picture of community. So that that's I think of the needs you talked about earlier being seen, soothed, safe, and secure with the infant experiencing love per their design to be seen, soothed, safe, and secure with their with their caregiver in the early formative years and how those innate needs are do those carry with us our entire lives and our wounds sometimes affect how we get them in healthy or unhealthy ways, but but those wounds, is that connected to the maturing into Christ-likeness by letting him meet those needs? And you're saying we can't grow to experience those things without community because we in community meet those needs as part of the healing maturing process? Yes. Um, and one of the best places that we can turn to in scripture is Psalm 139. Uh, we all know that passage because it says, you knit me together in my mother's womb and I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That is a profound 25 verses from King David before Jesus died on the cross, covering our sin. David is saying, God, you know me so intimately and thoroughly and completely. And yes, I'm the man after God's own heart who committed adultery and set up the murder of my mistress's husband. You know me so completely and thoroughly, and it's a good thing. It's a blessed thing. You lay your hand upon me, and such knowledge is too wonderful for me to attain. God, you're like a father who knows everything about me. You've known me my whole life. Uh, before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely. And that idea of you lay your hand upon me, it's not some kind of papal blessing from three feet away where the hand is lightly laid uh, to consecrate an individual. It's, it's the arm, it's the hand of a father, of a friend, of an embrace that pulls in. And in that psalm, there is this deep seeing that what allows David to be so free and to draw near to God with such wild abandon, even despite his deep brokenness and sinfulness, is that he's deeply known and deeply loved. Mm. And then in that embrace and that being drawn near, there's a soothing where I imagine if we picture that hand upon him, drawing him in and pulling him close, that David is exhaling and mm. that there's chemicals like oxytocin, the bonding attachment chemical that psychotherapists call the cuddle hormone. And there's, there's other realities going on in his brain and his body where he's learning at the neural level and at the posture level to just sink into love and there's a kind of soothing that then brings things like peace and joy and when i say bring things those things are already there because the fruit of the spirit is in us it's more like they start to sprout and rise up and flow from within there's a safety uh where i've always wondered like God, why in this beautiful psalm, Psalm 139, where, why are there these four verses toward the end about, you know, I hate all those who you hate and I want my enemies to topple. And it's like, that just spoils good poetry. <laughs> but what David is saying in talking about God commanding over his enemies is, I know that I'm safe because mm. those who are against me and those who oppose me, God, you've got that. I don't have mm. to worry about that. Versus me staying up all night, wringing my hands, you know, am I, am I going to get shot from the left or from the right? And that was a new insight for me because even that stuff, the, the quote, I'll pass these, this part of the Psalms over verses, even that stuff is about seeing, soothe, safe, and secure. Hmm. And I have a friend, Andy Kolber, who wrote the, the beautiful book that has become a bestseller in the last two years. Uh, she wrote the book, Try Softer. And I will commend her new book that's coming out in March uh, called Strong Like Water. Try Softer is about our vulnerability. Strong Like Water is about our strength. And she and I were together recently, and we were talking about attachment and theology and God. And she said, all theology is about attachment. Hmm. It's about connection. It's about how we grow together, the infant being able to attach to the parent, 
the branch being able to attach to the vine and the child of God being able to attach to and be deeply secure in the heart of God and in the hands of God. So <clears throat> we're made with these innate needs. You're writing a book called Love Has You. And, and true face, I, I know we, we speak of love as the process of meeting needs. And the ability to experience that love, I heard you just say that all theology is attachment. Atta attachment means what in this regard of love and needs? From a clinical <clears throat> perspective, attachment is a biological, primarily emotional, psychological, spiritual, and fundamentally relational process that happens neonatally before birth and right from the moment of birth it's the process by which we learn to trust and to feel secure in the presence of another so imagine an infant who for whatever reason doesn't have their primary caregiver around like um, someone who is in an institution and doesn't doesn't have a parent and a lot of attunement and attending to them they begin in their body as an infant to begin to react in their body where they shut down rather than cry out and they learn to expect that they're not going to get their needs met and if there is someone that is reliably sufficiently attending to them and meeting their needs they begin to exhale and I know that food is coming. I know that if I'm in pain and I'm crying that someone is coming and that they are kind and benevolent. Mm. Uh, and that that is a, a physiological process. That, it's interesting as uh, the attachment is the process of connecting, uh, leading to security and how you said the process which is, is, is it foundational to be able to trust? Because with healthy attachment, we have security, which is a foundational element to then a relationship of trust. I think that it's foundational. It's hardwired into us that we need to trust. And the infant comes into the world, you know, many of us have heard the phrase tabula rasa, a blank slate. I think that our nervous system is a blank slate and that there is this need to trust, like the infant doesn't have a cognitive concept that I need fluid and liquid in order to sustain beyond, for an infant, probably 48 hours. They don't have a knowledge that someone will come and give them uh, a bottle or a breast. But there is a responsiveness and a seeking that out. Interestingly, and I explore this a little bit in Love Has You, uh, one of my favorite images and passages in scripture around this idea of attachment is the idea of rootedness, R-O-T-T-E-D-ness. And in Ephesians 3.16, Paul is praying uh, one of three or four pastoral prayers for the Ephesians where he speaks a truth and then he prays about it. And then he speaks a truth and then he prays about it. And in chapter 3, regarding the love of God, he says, my prayer is is that you would be rooted and established in your inmost being. And so it's a picture of roots in a plant or a tree that go down deep. And in my office, I have a painting uh, or a piece of artwork, actually, that's about five feet high and three feet wide. And it's just a picture of roots from the top down. And it's the, it's the symbol of this. My prayer is that you'd be rooted and established in love. And he's speaking of the, the physical plant. But there's another kind of rooting. And you have like 23 kids, right? So you'll, you'll know about this. You actually have eight. Eight, that's right. Eight, eight children. God bless you to you and especially your wife. Yeah. So you'll, you'll know that when the infant is born, there's something called rooting. When they are on the mother's chest, when that baby is hungry, their mouth will begin to move and their lips will be positioned in such a way that it signals to the mother, it's time to feed the baby. That baby neurologically, through what we call neuroception, 
which is perception without knowledge. There's a response in the baby that the simple presence of the mother makes mm. the mouth begin to move and prepares the baby to take in the nourishment from the mother's own body and breast. And that is called rooting. Mm. And I find that absolutely fascinating that we literally need to root and to be rooted to receive the nourishment to grow to sustain our physiological being and then as the mother holds and as i'm saying mother i know there's people that have lost their mother or there's an adoption situation this can be a primary caregiver and if someone like me was bottle fed and not breastfed it's not about that so please don't feel like you're less than but as the caregiver, as the mother holds the infant in her arms, and we all know the Madonna and child picture by countless artists over the years, of the mother gazing into the face of the baby. Kurt Thompson mm. taught me this in the book, The Anatomy of the Soul, and in many conversations. The infant is born with 50 to 60% of the active neurons in the brain, which means that 50 to 40% of the 50 to 100 billion neurons in the brain are not actually online yet. They're there, but it's like a hard drive on a computer that is only half turned on. How do those other 50 billion neurons come online? Through the gaze of the parent into the eyes of the child. And again, through this neurological or neurobiological arc of parent to child gazing into the eyes, Picture 50 billion neurons going bing, 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 coming on for four, six, eight, ten years through the process of relational connection. That child is known, and the parent isn't saying to the two-week-old infant, you know, you look smart, and I'm convinced you're going to get into an Ivy League school, so thank you for what you're going to do for this family and maybe care for me in retirement. No. That infant has no worth of accomplishment, performance, achievement, other than existing and being. And there's this gaze of love and affection. Hmm. And so it comes back to the very, very first question you asked me of, you know, what's happening in my life and my, my spiritual walk is I'm learning to be loved. And when I sit and I go, here I am, to me, my relationship with God is about positioning myself to be gazed upon by love uh, which is John 15 rooted and abiding and as you were talking about that rootedness I that when I'm quiet enough that is the the only longing of my heart to experience is love and I get glimpses of that when I'm present with my kids and my wife and my friends but that experience of love that he meets through the spirit in you as a friend through uh, directly with him uh, resonates pretty deeply. And it, it's actually connected to one of the, the main things that I've been sitting in uh, because of you. You don't know this either. Uh, mm. you, you shared the 40 days to a deeper walk with God, 20 minutes a day of centering prayer. What's the title of that book? Uh, 40 Days to a Closer Walk with God by David yep. Meiskins. So you shared it. Uh, with me and Ross and we were talking about, I was like, I'm going to try to do it because I need to work on presence abiding. I did all 40 days this past year in 2022, 20 minutes of centering prayer, which I had never done in my life. And most every day, I think I did terrible at it. Um, I, I, uh, it was just hard. I mean, just to be with God, not even interact in dialogue, but just be in presence with God, which is a practice of centering prayer, which you turned me on to. And it was one of those days, uh, probably after a couple, uh, maybe 13 or 14, where I felt the gaze and it came through realizing like, I'm longing for intimacy. I'm longing to be present. I'm realizing in my midlife adjustments that I've, I've been pres present for, barely any of my life so far. Um, I'm constantly living in the potential of tomorrow. And so I, I've been asking, doing processing of like, what am I afraid of? What am I living towards? All part of midlife adjustment type stuff. And uh, the most content I've ever, the most present and content I've ever felt is when I've done kangaroo care with one of my babies you know, the skin to skin contact, just laying there. 
I I feel, and this was like a, a, a image during my centering prayer time, which I'm not supposed to be doing in centering prayer because you're supposed to just be present. God. So I was, uh, I think it was a gift of God that I was like, that is the most intimate, That that's the closest intimacy I've ever experienced. It's the richest experience of love. And it has nothing to do with productivity. I'm so unproductive just holding a baby I'm not doing anything, telling them anything, you know, speaking truth into their life. I'm just with them. And it, and there's a deep, deep, deep satisfaction, presentness, connectedness. And in that moment, it was just the father smiling on me going, that's what we get to do together. And that's the way you started of what love looks like you and your rhythms of just going, here I am, God, let's love each other. Um, and I, I got, love I, that. I got, um, an article right here, let me pull it up. It's called Sister Wendy Beckett, Hermit Simple Prayer. Chapter one, somebody sent this to me, but there was a line in here from this Sister Wendy who said, and, and I'm gonna land on this and then leave with you being able to share anything on your heart or you can pray for us, whatever, to wrap up this podcast. But she said, accept that God is good and that your relationship with him is prayer. And you must conclude that prayer is an act of utmost simplicity. So being with, that's very different than the listening, praying, going through my list. God is a good God and my relationship with him is prayer. And that's simple. Just with God, abide. That was the three page sermon that you talked about earlier that Jesus said is this, abide and and love has you. Um, and attachment is a, a Theology is attachment or salvation is attachment and, and man, how all that's interconnected. Uh, dude, you're awesome. I feel so encouraged and blessed. And it's just fun to have you as a, a new friend in my it life. It is fun. It is fun. Um, I enjoy you. And, and uh, for those of you who are listening to this, longing for intimacy of connectedness, we build tools for you to help you experience deeper relationships with God and others. And um, the one we're all in on, uh, I'm most excited about is a nine month group discipleship initiative that I'm, I'm trying to get Michael to lead so I can be in his group, but you meet once a month for three hours for nine months. And it's a real intentional journey to experience connectedness and process truths. Think of it like as community 2.0 it's group mentorship, discipleship, and it's a framework for those of us who want to pour our cup into others and don't know how. We just want to make it easier by collecting best practices, wisdom, so that you go, oh, I've wanted to experience more intimate relationships, pour my cup into others. You made it so easy. Thanks. It's not prescriptive. It's a process that in invites you onto a journey that makes it easier for you to know what to do, who to do it with, with a lot of best practices. So check out trueface.journey.org uh, or trueface.org forward slash journey. Um, check it out uh, for your church. Churches are launching this as a leader development group, uh, leader development pipeline, or individuals can launch it. Uh, I'm leading a group right now, and it's the funnest thing I get to do. So we're inviting some friends to do it as well. And Michael, what do you want to leave us with? I'll leave you with Psalm 27, verse 4. I think it's a good summary of our conversation. And this will be familiar to many people because it's the verse just after those famous words of the Lord is my light, my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? And as I have rehearsed those words over and over, and there's even a casting crown song about that, uh, I'm sure there's many songs, I've thought, but Lord, I'm so afraid. And Lord, I, I fear so many things. How do, I, how do I not do that? And it's right back to this idea of practicing presence. Psalm 27, 4, one thing, I ask of the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. So whenever anybody says, here's one thing, I pay attention. And as I pay attention, David is saying, I want to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. What's the temple and the house of the Lord today? Robbie Engel, Michael Cusick, you, True Faced podcast listener. God is not out there. He is not up there. God is within. And that's not a new age concept. That is the core of Trinitarian 
Orthodox Christian spirituality, Colossians 1, Christ in you, the hope of glory. I have been crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. We are invited to be present to ourselves, to dwell within ourselves, and to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord within. And as we begin to do this, our life begins to change and burgeon from the inside out the same way that a flower appears in a garden or in the same way that fruit appears on a tree. And so dwell, dwell in the house of the Lord, which is you, beloved child of God. Amen. Thanks, Michael.